questions in chat and uh, let us hear from you in chat. Our invitation will be given today by Phil Voss. Then Dan Dodd will lead us in the pledge. A lot of you have heard me talk about uh, President Franklin Roosevelt uh, and his things that he loved about the group and the Boy Scouts of America. He said that the most important organizations in the world for the youth of our nation are the Boy Scouts of America and Rotary International. He was also very much involved in prayer. So let us pray for food, for life, for opportunity, for friendship, and for room and fellowship. We thank the only one. Amen. 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 Fellow Rotarians, please join me in the pledge to our great country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. President Mary Bassett. Thank you, Ike. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being with us for the March 3rd um, hybrid meeting of the Rotary Club of West Jacksonville. Uh, thank you, Phil and Dan, for your service and our greeters, Tim Johnson and Ron. Um, as far as pop-ups today, I wanted to remind everybody that um, when we have our in-person meetings on the... Can you hear me? Okay. Um, make sure you, you please um, RSVP to DACDB so that um, Patty can plan accordingly for the meals. Um, we do have a pop-up today from William Milney. Thank you, President Mary Pat. In about two weeks, we're going to be celebrating the annual fun tradition of St. Patrick's Day. And we thank you to Mr. Charlie Fetzer, who has agreed to open up his place of business so we can have a social gathering. We are working on the details now. We want it to be in the, in the good spirit of St. Patrick's Day. Everybody will have some food, we'll have some drinks, but it will also be very responsible and very, we'll be able to accommodate distancing, but it would really be a lot for us to be together in a social setting and really it will really be a lot of fun. So Lee Davis and I will be in touch with you on the details, but please save the day for March 17th and get out your grade. Thank you, William. Well, we're looking forward to celebrating the Irish that day and everybody who pretends they are anyway. Um, I also wanted to ask you to save March, I mean, May 1st on your calendar. That is um, a Saturday and we'll be having a Rotary Day at Camp at Chockety in Orange Park. That's the uh, Boy Scouts base camp right there on the Doctor's Lake. And um, the Scouts will be hosting us for a, a day of fun activities. We'll be able to um, bring our families and kayak and shoot and do bows and arrows and roast marshmallows. So it'll be a little bit different, but it'll give us a chance to be outdoors and share some family time together. So that'll be May 1st. And with that, we have Lee Davis, for family of Rotary. Thank you very much, President Mary Pat. Uh, it's so nice to see everyone here today on this beautiful day. Um, we have a few birthdays on March 1st. We had Sue Irwin and Philip Guzman. Philip, excuse me. Okay. I'm sorry, uh, Mark Frost is on the floor. Harry Platt is on the 7th, and Dale Christ is on the 8th. Happy birthday to all of you all. And does anyone else uh, have a family event or something to share today? Okay, thank you so much again. Thank you, Lee. I did have a um, prayer request for everybody. If you'll keep my daughter Grace in your prayers, she had a um, severe anaphylactic uh, reaction to a medication that she was taking for migraines. So um, need your prayers for the next month or so as the medication 
runs through her system and um, we're just hoping to keep her out of the ER again. Um, so please keep Grace in your prayers. And um, our Sergeant at Arms, Dane, will introduce our guests and visiting Rotarians. And I also wanted to thank Dane for working with Marshall to um, get the technology squared away so that we can Zoom. Good afternoon. Thank you, President Mary Tatt. As most of you are probably well aware at this point, we have somewhat of a compromised production today. It's always a bit of a challenge when Marshall isn't able to make it. I would like to thank Will Croft, though, for wearing the cloak of endeavor with me today, <laughs> sharing in the small successes and the many failures so far. Uh, visiting guests and Rotarians, Peter Shutters is here from the Mandarin Club. Welcome, Peter. <laughs> All right, now that we don't have the district governor with us, let's see if I can get this joke right. The meanest, nastiest old man in a small town walks into his local grocery store and steals a can of peaches. He's arrested on his way out, pleads guilty to the judge eventually. And the judge asks him, sir, how many peaches were in that can that you stole? The man says, your honor, I believe there were five peaches in that can. Judge says, very well, I think I know what I want to do. Sir, I'm going to sentence you to five days, one day for every peach that you stole. Just then an old woman rises in the back of the courtroom and she says, your honor, may I be heard? Judge is taken aback. He says it's highly irregular, but yes, go ahead, let's hear you. And the woman said, your honor, I'll have you know that mean old man is my husband. And uh, he also stole a can of peach. Oh, wow. Can't beans. Yes. <laughs> all right. Can't all be winners. <laughs> President Mary Pat, that concludes my report. I'm not sure if I should thank you or not, Dane. <laughs> <laughs> be back next time, bro. All right, well, hey, bro. Hey. Um, also, with Family Rotary, I, I wanted to announce that we had the um, uh, presentation last week about the uh, increase in industrial space and all the industrial activity in the market. A uh, longtime Rotarian, West Jacks Rotarian Jeff Collins, uh, last week closed a huge deal with Lock Tech. Uh, they're building a warehouse and ready warehouse. So, congratulations to Jeff. Today's program is uh, also dealing with Jack Shane. Our, our guest speaker today is Dr. Carlton Robinson. Dr. Robinson is the Chief Innovation Officer for Jack's Chambers Venture Services Division. In 2014, he launched Jack's Bridges, an entrepreneurial education program that served over 2,000 business owners in its seven years of operation. That program has served over 200 small businesses here locally. Other leadership positions, and small business includes Startup Quest, University of Florida, Lean Startup Week, and Startup Weekend. In his Jack's USA capacity, Dr. Robinson is responsible for research, strategy, and implementation of small business initiatives that assist the Jack's Chamber in promoting regional economic growth from within. He has been a part of the Jacksonville community for over 20 years after work relocation brought him here for the town in 2000. Uh, West Jacks Rotarians, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Carlton Robbins. Thank you so much for, for having me. Uh, I was sharing with the, the few people on the way in. I'm so happy to actually see humans in person. Uh, so many of us have been limited to Zoom. And, uh, you know, at the chamber, one of the most important things uh, that we have to do is we've got to lead business activity, but we've got to do it in a safe way. So there's been a lot of challenges in the past uh, year trying to balance those. Uh, if you could advance two slides. Uh, one more. So um, one of the things that I want to focus on today is really 
kind of talk about how resilient Jacksonville has been. So we've heard a lot about uh, COVID-19 the impact that it's had on, on businesses. But I can tell you uh, here in Northeast Florida, we've actually uh, been a lot more resilient than some of the other places in the country. And I, I want to just give you some insight as to where we were, uh, at least as a small business community, prior to the pandemic. So if you take a look at, at these two charts, um, the purple uh, re re represents uh, businesses that we had opening. So take a look at maybe from 2015 to 18, I mean, we were really had a positive trajectory. We were doing a lot. Uh, we had a little bit of a slowdown in 2019, and then obviously the pandemic hit in 2020. Um, but these are really good charts to kind of show you where we were. So we really we kind of stabilized in 2019 and, and 2020. Next slide, please. Here, uh, what I want to show is uh, how we, as a community, really depend on smaller businesses. So my job at the Chamber is to engage and hopefully help grow as many small businesses as possible. And that takes time. So a lot of the people that I help today, it may take three to five years before they're adding five, 10, or 15 employees. But what I want to show you uh, today is how much our community depends on those types of businesses, which is why my team and what we do at the Chamber is so important. Um, in terms of what a small business means, so obviously most people think uh, sole proprietors, but there's another stage of small businesses, those that have two to nine employees. That area has grown tremendously in the last five to seven years here in Jacksonville. And then if we're lucky, we'll have some of those businesses grow to be 10 to 99 employees. That group of businesses that employs 10 to 99 employees is the most important group in our community. And we should really strive not only to support those businesses, but to help others grow to get to that. That's really where we start seeing businesses become enterprises. Uh, next slide, please. So this chart, and I can send this um, to Ike and he can uh, disperse it. But here, what I wanted to show you um, is if you look at those different categories from 2015 to 2019, and we take a look at those different sizes. And we, the first chart shows you how many establishments, so that would be um, how many businesses and locations. But then if you take a look at those establishments and how many jobs, that they're adding each year. So you'll see the businesses that have two to nine employees, they supply us with more jobs than any other category of business. So this is a completely different perspective of how important small businesses in our community. This is a big part of my job at the chamber. Um, now, obviously those businesses that are in the two to nine, they don't always have the infrastructure in place so that they can grow. And it's my job to kind of put programs in place and really help them with the relationships that they need in order to grow their business. That second group um, of, uh, see, that's me, 10 to 99. Now they're slightly less than the two to nine, but they're more stable. And sometimes those businesses are merging. And so uh, for those of you that may work in support services, um, you know, in my banking days, what I would say, if I were looking at this as a salesperson, I would really focus on how can I get a list or find the businesses that have 10 to 99 employees? Because that's gonna be the most stable in terms of revenue generation. That's gonna be the most stable in terms of number of employees. And so our goal here in Northeast Florida is, is to drive that number up and then to develop the two uh, tonight. Uh, next slide, please. Does all of that make sense to everybody? Um, most people haven't seen those, those previews uh, in this way. Now, I also wanted to share um, 
as a chamber, how did we make it through the pandemic? Now, we still have a little ways to go, um, but as things start to open up a little bit more, um, not all of the stories are bad. Not all of the stories are bad. I think all of us have faced some challenges with the pandemic, but I can tell you in working with our small business leaders of the year, um, more than I ever have last year, what I learned and uh, what we talked about was what are some of the things that we can do during the pandemic that can position our business to grow? So we really focused on that for much of last year when we met in small groups just like this. Um, some of those things that we, we talked about, it had more to do with um, being a team and inspiring each other and having a sounding board for the things that are happening in my business. So for example, we had several um, small business leaders of the year who uh, their business was focused on technology. So anything in technology last year, you probably had a record year. And then we had some others who were more uh, consumer-based, which their business is predicated on meeting people, much like the chamber. And that was taken away from us. So then we had to find innovative ways to engage clients. Um, I think the toughest thing that we talked about, which is still tough today, is how do we prospect when everything is online? And so one of the things we really focused on is even though we were you know, in the pandemic, you still can't take away the power of meeting with people like you're doing today. Like this is so important. And we might not have the numbers that we used to have. We're going to have to, you know, reevaluate what does a good event mean, right? So before we'd say, oh my gosh, there were 65 or 70 people. That was a really good event. But the reality is, if the quality is high and that number is low, that might be a better event because I have more time. There's a higher touch. And what we've been emphasizing is as we you know, start to come out of the pandemic in a responsible way, the peer-to-peer -peer activity is the best way for a business. So peer-to-peer -peer activity in small groups like this is the best way to grow your business. Next slide, please. Now, I'm very proud of this, and, and all of us should be. But when we talk about resiliency, and one of the things that we used to complain about, let's say even two or three years ago, as we compared ourselves to some of the larger cities. We would always say uh, Jacksonville doesn't really have uh, that one place where there's a lot of density. We're really spread out. Well, during the pandemic, that's actually worked to our favor. And what we've seen is uh, not only on the residential side, but we've also seen more businesses inquiring and moving to Jacksonville because of that. So what was once a deficiency for us in terms of density, is now creating a lot more opportunity for us. Um, we're really excited at the Chamber because they're helping us, okay, in terms of bringing people in and creating excitement. So I really wanted to show this in terms of Northeast Florida as a region. Like, we're doing really good. We've got a positive trajectory. Um, you know, as we take a look into the future, it's still unknown what normal is going to be, I think. We'll have to create, recreate that in terms of size, but we're in a really good place with a lot of positive things happening as we move forward. Next slide, please. So my job, and this is kind of a technical slide, but I, I, I need to show this. So right now, my job uh, at the chamber is really focused on how can we increase our competitiveness as a region. This is going to require us to be more innovative than we have in the past. So it won't be good enough for me to just say we have Jack's Bridges and we're helping small businesses. Really what I'll have to do and what I've been spending my time the last six months is actually working with our larger enterprises like the Florida Blues and the Mayos, those types of companies, and identifying what are some of the use cases that they're working on and making those available for smaller businesses to offer treatments and solutions. So we have lots of great things going on here already, but it's not always accessible to those businesses that are two to nine employees or 10 to nine employees. So I've got to work with government, I've got to work with the academic institutions, 
and then obviously the different industries. And that's where I spend the bulk of my time. It's a lot of fun. Um, it's a lot of challenges too, but more fun than challenges on most days. Uh, next slide. I wanted to show this slide, and this is like really, really busy, right? And I know all of you recognize this one, yeah. right? Because I think sometimes people will tell me I am zoomed out, right? Um, but what we had to do, and what I, I hope all of you have done, is making this transition during the pandemic. We had to find different ways to communicate and different ways to prospect. But most importantly, how do we make ourselves available? And so these are just some of the technologies that, that we focused on, but there's four key areas. Um, and, and I think all of us are affected by at least two, but things that we had to do to improve um, our ability to compete post pandemic. So number one is gonna be business processes. A lot of what we do in the people business all of a sudden we have to have processes in place because we're not meeting face-to-face. -face. And so if there were five things that I wanted to accomplish face-to-face, -face, now there's maybe three of them were accomplished before we even meet. So we've, you know, registrations, uh, different things are automated. All of those are things that uh, in the business world, I mean, everyone has them now, which we didn't have as many uh, prior to the pandemic. Uh, the second thing would be the customer experience. I think this is where we've won a lot at the chamber is actually creating and focusing on a customer experience. So when someone engages with us, how do they get better? How do we create an experience for them that makes them want to engage with us more? Um, and then the third would be channels of distribution, which is probably the most important um, today, again, for those of us that are in the people business, you know, what are all the ways that we can distribute our message? And then what are all the ways people can get to us? Um, I would say this is probably the biggest efficiency for most small businesses because of resources. But with technology, uh, there's just a lot more opportunities. And then uh, that last one with uh, digitization, um, just converting a lot of what we do into automated processes. Um, we were forced to do this. I was forced to do this uh, in a matter of two weeks with our Jack's Bridges program. We were serving 100 people in person and when we announced uh, the pandemic, we were like, oh, we'll be back in about three or four weeks. Um, <laughs> and here we are a year later, right? And so, um, but because we have, you know, the resources and, and these are things that I've been taking a look at over the last two years, uh, we were able to get it. Most people converted, um, we've got even more tools than this, but in getting them converted, we actually served more people last year than in any year that I've been at the chamber. I've been there for nine years because of these tools and processes. So I wanted to share this with you. It's, it was hard, but it put us in a very good place as we move forward. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I, have, I think I have two or three slides left, but I want to paint a, a, a picture for you of where I think the future of supporting small business and entrepreneurs will be. And it has a lot to do with the previous slide in terms of what types of tools and everything that we use. So if there's one thing that I would hope you would leave with today, uh, it would be the power and influence of being connected to groups like this, to groups like this that are in other places. Now we have that ability through technology to create lots of different peer-to-peer -peer networks. I want you to take a look at this slide. These are all of our uh, major colleges in the state of Florida. And the reason that I have this slide is because the small businesses and entrepreneurs that are in the communities where there are colleges, like we have UNF, they tend to have more resources. Those that are not in those communities don't have as much resources, which is a major issue because there's a lot of opportunity there. And so as we take a look at the state of Florida, we can see here, most of our state is not properly supported for entrepreneurs. 
take a look at the communities that don't have the major colleges. All right, next slide. So one of the things that we're working on right now is how can we mobilize resources? So let's say we have the best resources and we will one day here in Northeast Florida for supporting entrepreneurs. Wouldn't it be great if from Jacksonville, we were able to support entrepreneurs <coughs> in the entire state of Florida, that people were actually coming to Jacksonville, connecting to Jacksonville's resources to grow and scale businesses. Like that's a real thing right now because of technology. And the premise behind this is, if I'm a small business, I have to go out and do business with a city government, with industries, with economic development agencies, with all of these different groups. And I don't want to do that because it takes too much time. It takes too many resources. So if we can develop uh, technology that allows us to be a gateway, then it changes the dynamics of Northeast Florida. It makes us one of the most important pillars in terms of supporting entrepreneurs, not only in our state, but a gateway for the Southeastern region. Uh, next slide, please. Which then would make the state of Florida look this way. We would actually be able to fill the gaps as we uh, fill those gaps. Our small business owners, investors connected to the Jacksonville community would have access and be able to support uh, entrepreneurs and small businesses throughout the state of Florida. So this is my vision for Jacksonville as we come out of the pandemic. The things that are going to be the most important one, all of us are going to have to make sure we continue uh, to leverage technology. But number two, we have to maintain peer-to-peer -peer activity and actually meet with real people. Like there's going to be a balance that we're going to have to strike. Um, and so this is my last slide. Um, this is our vision for you know, improving and making uh, Northeast Florida a gateway both virtually and physically. And um, I think we're in a race between us and the Jaguars to see who makes it happen first. Will we get to this first or the Super Bowl first. So I think I'm going to win. I think, <laughs> uh, I think I can do it within within 18 to 24 months. I think we can, we can make this happen. Um, so with that, I have a little time for questions. I want to thank you guys for allowing me to come and share. And uh, I, I do have two, I have two gifts before I have my questions. One for the president and one for Ike for, for getting here. Oh, thanks. Um, so I, I brought some some coins. Got to show this off. So one for you, one for the president. Uh, that's my signature program, and uh, thank you guys for having me. Thank you. Questions? That's a very insightful presentation. Um, I am in the TIAA building, is where my office is located, one on Bay Street. That is a building that used to have four to 5,000 people in it. It now has about 200 people in it. Hmm. And my question is, do you think the work from home trend will continue even after the COVID crisis has subsided? Um, so that's a complex question. I definitely have a chamber answer. Um, so, so a couple of things. So some of the companies um, have a regional presence, but headquartered elsewhere. In a lot of our conversations, um, the work from home is being mandated from a different location. So while we're experiencing COVID differently here in uh, Jacksonville, a company like SoFi has a different experience in Salt Lake City. And so right now, um, what we've seen is a lot of companies have said uh, May and June is one demarcation line. <coughs> And then others have said the end of 2021, and they'll re-evaluate. Um, but those are corporate decisions. I think as, uh, as a community, one of the things that we'll have to take a look at is, um, you know, how do we induce events? 
right? That create density, um, that create activities that allow people to engage in a safe way. And so that may take us, you know, another year, but I would say those numbers are, are going to increase. Not everyone likes working from home, and there are several industries where it's not as efficient to work from home. No. Yes. Early on, you were talking about small business, large business, start back and forth. And I, I got out of the Navy and then went into the small business area and then quickly went to the large business part. Where are we right now in Jacksonville? I mean, how do you, how do you discriminate between what's small business and what's large business? Because it has a lot to do with what you can bid on uh, significantly in Jacksonville. And, and so, uh, do you have any? Yeah, yeah. So typically, uh, small business in Jacksonville um, is going to be less than 100 employees. The, the real sweet spot for us is probably around 50, 60 employees, right? So 10 to 50, 60 employees. You have, um, you know, within that, once you get to a certain level, you know, the cost of insurance kicks in, there are different levels for that. Um, but in terms of distinguishing between the large businesses or the small, <laughs> typically once you're over 500 uh, employees, you can consider large. But one of the things that we're dealing with right now is uh, in the past, number of employees was a significant um, <laughs> description of, of, I have a big company. But today, because of technology, you could have a, 10 or 15 person company that's generating hundreds of millions of dollars depending on their product or service. So I think as we come out of the pandemic, that's gonna be another thing that we take a look at in terms of how do we look at large versus medium and small companies. It could be uh, based on revenue, but I think we are depending less on number of employees. Yes. This might be more of a post COVID question but has the chamber and the mayor's office given any in, insight or intent on what they plan to do with the old side of the landing and the old side of the old courthouse, which are now just parks and vacant fields? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a complex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're among friends. So, yeah. okay. so, so <laughs> you're among friends. Landing um, is a beautiful, beautiful site right now to take a look at the river, but I think, one of the things that uh, we're focusing on with downtown development as a whole, we have several groups that are focusing on downtown development. Uh, my bias is around innovation. And so JTA is, is really working on the autonomous vehicles. And if you take a look at uh, whatever development takes place near the stadium, and we take a look at the core, everything in between that, um, I believe there's an opportunity for development. And that's where we're going to start to get more traffic and people back downtown. So creating opportunities for people to engage, whether that's a hotel, um, whether that's you know, different types of industry, whether that's uh, buildings that have uh, proximity and travel in between, walkable, like all of those things are under consideration uh, right now, and some of them have already started. Right. A few more questions? No, no, I Robinson, I, I have one. Okay. Is, is a, uh, um, an entrepreneur need to be a member of the chamber to benefit from your services? Uh, no, they do not. So um, while we would love for everyone to, to be a member of the chamber, um, one of the approaches that we take in is uh, we go out and we secure funding from foundations, from the state and sometimes federal funding. And our goal is to provide at least a certain level of services to support entrepreneurs, to get them started. You know, most of them are gonna be in that two to nine category. And if we can provide the infrastructure training opportunities to help them um, as they grow that business, hopefully they'll see value in the chamber as they get bigger, they'll join us later on. Uh, but you can absolutely be a part of our, our Bridges program. Um, I've got a cool thing that we're going to launch on maybe, uh, I think, the 17th um, that we'll talk about. 
um, but a, a key part of the chamber is economic development. And we can't always do economic development for members only, uh, but it's an investment into the community. And we do a great job with economic development. We will do the other things. You had a no? Okay. Uh, I have, I know a couple of people, so I'm going to ask some questions. Okay. This point. Uh, so I'm going to go with Ed. Um, I haven't seen Ed in, in, in a long time. And uh, my question would be for you, Ed, is uh, you know, working with different types of clients and small business owners, uh, what would you say have been maybe the two most challenging things for you uh, during COVID? And uh, what's one thing I could do that would uh, to support you. I think just managing people's expectations, you know, because some people want to go out and just live, other people in the middle, other people are hiding in their closet waiting for the world end. So managing expectations, it all comes down to relationships. As everyone in the room knows, people don't care what you know, they know you care. And then for you, just keep doing what you're doing. We need uh, you know, more things to take Jacksonville to the next level. I love it here. Everyone in this room loves it here. But we're the people of the future that are going to take Jacksonville to the next level. He let me off easy, so I'm going to say thank you. <laughs> I'll be more than happy to come back in, in a few months and give you an update on uh, things that we've done once we are able to get out into the community a lot more. So I do have a question. Uh, what Rotary Club are you a member of today? I'm not a member yet. <laughs> okay. Yet. Okay. okay, but I, I think I will be a member soon. How about that? All right. Again, thank you guys uh, so much for having me and giving me an opportunity to uh, to share. And uh, it's great to be amongst those who also love Jackson. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. You heard it first. Make sure to Jackson member. <laughs> All right. Um, just a couple of reminders. Uh, St. Patrick's Day Social on the 17th. Charlie Fetcher is hosting that. Uh, Mike Fish is hosting a May 1st Family Day at the Boy Scout Camp. Be a lot of fun. Um, Next week, our speaker is Lindsey Brock. So the last naval battle of the Revolutionary War was fought March 10th, 1783. Some of our members, membership remembers that day. <laughs> <laughs> Next week, we're meeting on March 10th, 2021. And uh, I think that's 238 years, the 238th anniversary. And Lindsey Brock's a local attorney and historian that's going to talk about that battle. It's going to be on Zoom. There will be no meeting in person, so sign up on Zoom. And don't forget the RSVP for all the future in-person meetings. Um, Palmer Bell, would you mind coming up and leading us in four-way test? While Palmer's making his way to the podium, I wanted to remind everybody that March 17th date that we're having the St. Patrick's Day there will be no meeting that day. We're having the social instead of a meeting since we have five Wednesdays. Thank you. Let me invite you to join me in uh, four things that we believe as a rotary. First, is it the truth? Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it be a little bit of Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Uh, the quote of the day is from Will Rogers. <clears throat> when I die, I want to die peacefully in my sleep like my grandfather did. Not screaming in terror like all the passengers in this car. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's